What up, what up, what up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Charter Podcast presented by St. Xavier University. It's another losing episode of the Charter Podcast presented by St. Xavier University, but a new and exciting way for the Bears to lose a football game. Looked like they were down and out. They score 11 points in just over 90 seconds. They get the onside kick, which almost never happens in the middle. And this time it's the defense that lets them down. Um, Lapka, I'm going to start with you just reactions to this football game. Wait, it's so funny because we were in the office this week and Clay and I were talking, how can the Bears lose a football game that's crazier than any of the ways they've lost under Matt Eberflus? And I think they might have found a crazier way. I think they might have found a way. I mean, a, what, talk about a roller coaster of emotions watching that game. You're up, you're down. Um, it, it was a wild game to witness and honestly a game they should have won. Right. It is a game they should have won. They shouldn't even I, th- I think they should have won the game in regulation. You have critical errors. You continue to beat yourselves. But the takeaway is and will be in all of these games going forward. Caleb Williams, the play of Caleb Williams. How is the development? How is the progression? What did he do to help the team win? And he got the team in a position to win. And they unfortunately lost the team in the game with that sack that you, that you just can't take. Just a rookie mistake. Right. But overall, what a game from Caleb Williams. I saw really positive, uh, positive rather progression from him. Felt great about him. But just still, as a Bears fan, as a as a watcher of this team, crushing. It, it, it still is crushing games you should be winning against teams that are objectively good. And that's, that's what makes it hurt the most. So uh, I know, Clay, I know you said it beforehand, emotionless. I know you didn't feel that way during the game, a little of a roller coaster of emotions during the game. But emotionless now, tell me why. Because it seems like the same thing happens every week, Kevin. You're right. We had that same conversation. You know, I was kind of half joking, talking about how they're going to find a way to lose. It's different. And, and it's not. It's serious. They found another way to lose. That is just that is just crazy. And I, I don't know if I wanted to be negative Nancy or positive Paul here, but for me now, I'm so kind of like removed from the game to game stuff that's happening here that I'm taking this whole wholesale approach and look. And like you said, what did we see? We saw Caleb Williams again with crunch time. We've seen it a lot lately. He's a guy that excels with the game on the line, down in crunch time. That's what you need from a young quarterback. He showed he can make plays with his feet. We weren't seeing that a lot early in the season. And he showed he can make a lot of plays with his arms. And he had a lot of drops today. A drop, drop, drop. Guys are usually sure-handed. Keenan Allen, Cole Komet, he had a lot of drops. So for him to come back and show that resilience, the most important thing that we saw today, obviously you want to win. Obviously you're playing neck and neck with a 9-2 and two football team. 9-2. and two. Quietest 9-2 and two football team, I think, in the, in the history of the NFL. Mm-hmm. Nobody's talking about them. They're 9-2. and two. They're a good football team. Great defensive coordinator. Sam Darnold's playing solid. Kevin O'Connell, great head coach, offensive coordinator. They were neck to neck with that team and could have came out with the victory. And Caleb Williams showed that he is willing to compete with anybody. Brian Flores was seven and one against rookie quarterbacks coming into this game. Caleb Williams not only handled the blitz, he excelled versus the blitz. And for me as a player, when he starts sending these confusing blitzes, he's coming from there. You're trying to get the count right at the line. Is this overloaded? Is this not overloaded? He made the right plays. He may have missed a hot here or a, or a hot there, one or two, but he consistently stayed in the pocket, kept his eyes downfield, showed great pocket awareness, which at the beginning of the year, I'm like, where is this guy's pocket awareness? Showed a great pocket awareness and continued to improve. Obviously, Kevin alluded to the sack that we don't want to see him take. Can't take that. That is a re- learning learning mistake right there. You, mm-hmm. you, you got to learn from that. But overall, Alex, I think that I was very encouraged with what I saw from Caleb and some of these other playmakers on this Bears Bears team. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we talked about it all week. Was uh, this was going to be Caleb Williams' biggest test going up against Brian Flores in that exotic rush scheme? And they needed to have a good plan, and they needed to have clear answers, and then they needed to execute. And Caleb Williams really did a very good job of that throughout, and he made himself right even when he was wrong. The throw to DeAndre Swift down the sideline where he just drops it in the bucket. I mean, just an unbelievable throw. Caleb Williams, after the game, admitted he made a mistake. He miscounted the guys on the line. He did not have the right check or did not have the right read pre-snap. Post-snap, he realizes, "Uh uh-oh, Andrew Van Ginkle is coming at me right away. (laughs) Avoids Andrew Van Ginkle. 
then realizes, okay, what should have happened is not happening. Recognizes that DeAndre Swift has triggered. DeAndre Swift goes in the flat, triggers to go down the scene. So good on you, DeAndre Swift. Caleb Williams recognizes these things happening post-snap, turns into an incredible play. So even when Caleb Williams was wrong, he found a way to make himself right. He found a way to put the team in a position, like a successful position. And that's that's now taking good quarterback play and making that great, special quarterback play. But it was also the, the benign stuff that was great. I mean, the tight window throws that he was making, mm-hmm. elevated level. The layered throws he was making today. That dig route to DJ Moore to set up the field Unreal. goal, to layer that over the the kind of second level of the defense before the safeties. Again, super tight window, super high pressure moment. Got to have it. He gets it done. Um, and just one more note. I mean, when you look at the line for Caleb Williams, 32 completions on 47 passes for 340 yards and two touchdowns, no interceptions. I don't think that's how the Bears want to win a football game. The Bears probably want to win a football game with a healthy dose of running the football, taking the pressure off. DeAndre Swift had nothing going on, no Mm -hmm. space on the ground today. They needed Caleb Williams to be the guy, and he made enough plays. Yes, we got to keep mentioning the sack because the sack, you can't have it in overtime. It's brutal, Uh, especially when you have an opportunity to win the game with a touchdown there. So can't have that. But other than that, they needed him to be great in big moments that he was. So spectacular day for Caleb Williams. Kevin, you're ready. ready to, shut yeah, up. I, I mean, I'm ready to make the declaration. I think he's him. I think he's him. I'm going to use some 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 terms here. I think he's him. I'm putting it down. I am. Stamped. Look, this is. I'm stamping it. I'm stamping it. Uh, it may, maybe it's a little bit premature, but I'm I'm excited from what I saw. I, I I really am. And this is something we've talked about for weeks, right? I mean, even in games where he's looked bad in the first three quarters, right? You think about that Washington game, of course, which is going to end up being the fracture that broke their season. But you look back at that game. You look back at the Packers game and clay you hit on it It, it's about rising up in the fourth quarter and that's the difference between good and great that's the difference between great and legendary right that's what we're looking at with caleb williams and and i'm not putting the legendary stamp on him i'm not that's not what i'm trying to do but you see the tendencies from him of okay things haven't gone right in the first three quarters you've dealt with adversity right in the fourth quarter when things matter the most you rise up to the occasion that's been a problem for bears quarterbacks for a long time it's been a problem for the team for a long time So to have a guy who is young as he is, a rookie, who's kind of leading the charge of, hey, we're not out of this game. I'm going to set the tone here in the fourth quarter. I'm going to make every play necessary, and I'm going to put our team in a position to win. That says a lot about who he is as a player and him as a leader and the kind of guy that you have as a 22-year-old kid to be in that position, rising up to the occasion in every single big moment. I mean, that that's that's why I, I make the him declaration right now it's derived from that and it is premature but you got to be bold sometimes and from what i've seen (laughs) he does pass the eye test you're right he passed the eye test am i I crazy for putting the him stamp on it no way uh it's is it early definitely but he passes he passes the eye test labka he definitely does um before we wrap up caleb williams talk uh clay you got anything more for qb1 well, let's just read off his numbers for those that didn't see it. I mean, 32, 47, 68 percent, 340 passing yards, 33 rushing yards, which he led the team, two passing TDs and 103 pass rating. And that's with a few drops right there. OK, so I think you're seeing is just growth, man, and just strict growth. And then the other thing I want to talk about since Thomas Brown took, take, has taken over, Caleb Williams has averaged 2.42 seconds before releasing. So he is getting the ball out quick. And then on third down, for me, I always look at who wins the third down. But I know we're going to talk about third down, but this is just something that stuck out to me about Caleb Williams on third down. The money down, Brian Flores. That's when he's draw, draw, drawing up all these crazy blitzes. 9 to 12, 128 yards and two touchdowns. Not That's that's against the blitz. I'm sorry, not third down. We'll talk about third down later. But 9 to 12 versus the blitz with two touchdowns. Eating up the blitz. If you can't blitz this guy and he's a rookie, that's usually the, 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 the last thing to come is protections, blitzes, hot routes. You'll see he's starting to pick that stuff up and be explosive against the blitz. Now teams are looking at, man, we're not going to – we're going to have to sit back in coverage and just – because he's he's 
but he's just excelling versus the blitz. And as a player, I know how difficult it is versus the blitz to get all 11 on the same page and to get the quarterback to get the ball out. And he even he throws a perfect hot route to Keenan Allen on a blitz hot route. Keenan doesn't get his eyes around, ball tips off his hands. I'm like, bro, what a what a read. What a play. It's slowing down for him. That is exactly what we needed to see. Uh, before we dig into Thomas Brown, because we should dig into Thomas Brown some more, uh, Kevin Lacka declared Caleb Williams him. Caleb Williams has etched himself into Bears history. He did do that this week. He now holds the Bears franchise record for passing yards for a rookie quarterback. I had it right here. He now has 2,356 yards. Mitchell Trubisky was the previous record holder. Uh, and Trubisky was just north of uh, 2,100. I think actually just under 2,200. So he's between 21 and 2,200 yards. Caleb Williams eclipsed him, and he's got a lot more time to do it as well to uh, to extend that lead. Now, what's interesting, Thomas Brown, he takes over this offense. Caleb Williams was asked, what's the difference? Like, it's, it's essentially the same offense, but obviously, you know, there's some different play calling. There's this, that. Caleb was like, he had a long play. He goes, I don't want to use this word, but it's his aura, man. He's got the aura. He's <laughs> got that? the aura. I love that. Yes. The aura. And then he said, in the crunch moments of that game, Thomas Brown is in the headset, basically saying, go be Superman. Dude, play free. Be Superman. Be you. Be like, be great. Um, so that's excellent. So, Clay, I'm going to kick it right back to you. Thomas Brown, the aura the offense, the improvements that we've considered that we've continued to see your thoughts. And firstly, I'm going to translate for us uh, that aren't the Gen Zers. I mean, <laughs> I'm just going to translate. That just means present. He has a presence about himself from the first press conference. He said exactly what I wanted to hear, Alex. Here's what he said. And this is what Shane Waldron. I don't want to, you know, everybody was dumping on Shane Waldron on the way out. And he's showing this. But he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, and me, and me and Kevin talked about this earlier on at CHSN when we were doing some content. He goes, I'm going to design plays for Caleb Williams to get the ball out of his hands as quickly as humanly possible. And then when it's relevant in third downs, red zone, and extenuating circumstances, different situations, we're going to ask him to put on the cape and be Superman and do the God given things that we drafted him to do. And okay, at first I'm like, that could be some coach speak, but I'm like, I love it. He gets it. You gotta get, you gotta have some rhythm to the game. You can't just drop back and have him running around there like crazy. No, get on time, on rhythm. When time calls for it, when it's third and 19 and you and you're on a last minute drive and you got to get a first down last week, get it to fourth and three, then she'll throw the back shoulder. Get yourself in a position to kick a field goal that obviously will get blocked, but you know, just to do those things. Thomas Brown figured that out. He has a good rhythm. He's getting the balls to his playmakers in space. He drew up some great plays for DJ Moore, getting him the ball in space. That's something for some reason Shane Waldron couldn't do. Keenan, he's using him how Keenan Allen needs to be used. Keenan dropped too many passes. I counted like two or three. Some one of them you might not count as a drop. I guarantee you, Keenan Allen. Counts that third down as a drop. The, the one that was high that tipped off his hands, he's got to catch that ball. It hits your hands, you got to catch it. NFL locker room, your coach is giving you a double minus because that's a drop. Hits your hand. Coach, it barely touched my fingers. It hits your hand. You're in the NFL. You got to catch it. F- future Hall of Famer. So he's putting these guys in the right situation. I love him getting getting Cole Komet back involved. And even Cole had a drop today, which, you know, he mm-hmm. it's his first drop of the year. Very, very consistent tight end, but the presence he has, the quickness that he has to get the play in the huddle is paramount. And I'll tell a quick story. I go from playing with the Jacksonville Jaguars, right? And I was with the Eagles too, Mike Vick, Blake Bortles. When you go in the when you go in the huddle, guys, here's how they call the play. Say I'll, I'll just call the same play to keep it consistent. Say green right, 373, Y stick, X slop, kill, 44 zone on one. Ready, break. Okay, that's how we call the play with the kill going into a normal huddle. I, at this point, I played in the NFL for seven years. For some reason, I decided I wanted to go play with the New England, New England Patriots. In hindsight, I should have stayed with the Jaguars. A lot harder roster to make. They cut me after six games. But the first OTA, I'm, in the, I'm with the first team, first group. 
I don't know, whatever. I go in the huddle with Tom Brady. Green right 373 Y-Stack X-Op on one ready break. I am not I am not exaggerating. It is like an auctioneer. Brady gets the play, calls it immediately. You can barely hear it. I'm going, wait, wait, wait. Time, time, what did you say? I go, I, I'm looking, how did these guys hear that? That's how Tom calls plays. Why? He calls, he wants to get to the line of scrimmage. He wants to have just those two more seconds to be able to ID the safeties, to look at the down linemen, to see who's blitzing. Okay, we got we got a linebacker stacked over a slot defender over a nickel back, right? So now one of those guys are blitzing. You can tell. They're not going to have two players in the same spot. He's coming. He's coming. Okay, we're going to slide the line to the left, and it gives you more time. The timing, getting the plays in quicker, getting the call in quicker, to get to the line of scrimmage, to be able to see things is huge for quarterbacks. It's it just it just changes the game. Two, three, four seconds is a huge amount of time to be in that situation, to have that time to look at the defense and to kind of come up with a plan, what you want to do. And that is another thing that Thomas Brown has emphasized and done a great job with. Interestingly, before I kick it to you, Kevin, that was one misstep on the critical fourth down when there was yep. a ton of confusion. Yeah, Cairo Santos is coming onto the field. Tory Taylor's coming onto the field. The Bears don't know what they're doing. Caleb Williams said he actually misheard the play <laughs> that Thomas Brown called, <laughs> and that slowed down everything, and that's why they nearly had to delay a game. That was a very disjointed fourth down, kind of a pivotal moment. So one moment where the, the communication, and again, this is time on task. This is chemistry. <laughs> it, it comes with time. It comes with experience. The communication had been good in that moment, had failed them. But, Kevin, you are our preeminent aura judge in the <laughs> CHFN digital department. So as the preeminent aura judge, is Thomas Brown passing the aura check? Yeah, he's exceeding it significantly. He's doing a great job with his aura right now. And I'll ask you guys a question here because I've been noticing this. And when you said what you said about uh, Thomas Brown and Caleb Williams, you're talking about him being Superman. It kind of brought it to a head for me. This offseason – Assuming Matt Eberflus is, is let go, which I think we believe is going to happen, Ben Johnson's the big ticket item. I think we all know that. There's skepticism as to whether Ben Johnson wants to coach here, right? He, there's reports that he wants security at certain organizations. He wants healthy organization that he wants to go to. The Bears have proven to not be a very healthy organization for head coaches. If they do not look out on Ben Johnson, who's clearly the big fish in, in the offseason you know, head coach market, I'm starting to think Thomas Brown sort of have it, has an inside track to be the next head coach of the team, right? And and part of it is that aura. Part of it is like just exuding that confidence and him being able to to translate that to the players, right? The players, I feel like in certain scenarios, right, Clay. I know it's probably not the same when it comes to a guy like Bill Belichick, but like you take a look at Detroit right? They want to feel that connection to their coach, a coach who has the same passion for the game as they do. And that's not to say that Matt Eberflus doesn't have passion uh, and not to say he's not connected with the players. We really don't know, but I feel like on a deeper level, and when you talk about that, or, and, you, and when you said what you said about Caleb Williams and Thomas Brown there, it, it makes me think that there is a really strong connection between the team and Thomas Brown. Even if it's just that little clip that we saw from that small camera in the press box of how excited he was when they scored their first touchdown in 25 drives last week against the Packers, that was something that I feel like probably meant a lot to the team seeing like, okay, this this means something to him. Them succeeding and them you know, putting in the work to finally get on the board with that touchdown, that means something, right? And if you want to avoid – the, the critical mistake the Bears have made for every single rookie quarterback of switching over head coaches in the second year. If you want to avoid the effects of that to a greater degree, then maybe you keep Thomas Brown around because it's the same system and it and, and, and it's they have familiarity with them and you avoid some of those problems of a complete seismic organizational shift by bringing in a whole new staff. And I know, like, again, I, I, I would want Ben Johnson to be the head coach of the Bears next year if Matty Refus were fired. That, that's, that would be my pick. Right. But if that falls through, which it looks like it could be like Thomas Brown has experience as an assistant head coach who won a Super Bowl under Sean McVay, one of the best head coaches in the NFL. This is no slouch from a resume standpoint, from a ability to be a coach standpoint. So when you talk about aura, he is exceeding it to answer your question. And I think that there's something to monitor as a development of could this guy actually be the next head coach of the Bears, if, if Matt Eberflus were to be let go. I don't know. It, it seems possible. I think he deserves a look. 
I mean, he's he more than deserves a look, especially if Caleb Williams' development and the offensive improvement continues. One more thing that I think, you know, was was great seeing out of Thomas Brown's game plan today. And Clay, this is something that you and I talked about after the Packers game last week. We're like, whoa, Roma Dunze is in the backfield. That was weird. He didn't really get the ball. He was the motion man and he was a decoy. And then he was a lead blocker. And then he was kind of like cutting off the back to cut off the pursuit guys. It'll be interesting to see how the Bears iterate off of that. And sure enough, Roma Dunze was back in the backfield today. And what happened? They sent him out in the flat. He caught a nice pass, got some good blocks in front of him, 12 yards, first down. That's the type of multiplicity. That's the type of iteration, the week-to-week changes, the week-to-week tweaks that we're talking about when we talk about, hey, how are you changing the wrinkles week-to-week? How are you giving a defense new looks? How are you mixing things up? So that's a microcosm of how Thomas Brown is able to keep things fresh, keep things iterative, keep defenses on their toes. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's huge. And he's he seems to me like he has a plan, right? He's not just out there calling like when you're playing when when Kevin's playing Madden, he's just picking plays. He don't he ain't setting anything up. No, you got to give me some respect, Clay. I'm in the formations three. (laughs) (laughs) He's picking. He's got a plan. He's setting up a play. He knows he's showed this formation. He knows he got some tendencies with certain personnel grouping. So when you come out with a certain personnel grouping, the defense thinks, okay, these guys are going to line up in this formation based on this personnel grouping. If it's three wide receivers, now you put Rome in the backfield and the rules are shot. They were expecting three wide. Now not Rome's in the backfield. This is a, a formation would be, we used to call it like pony or something. Now they're, they're, they're rule set. You're putting a lot of stress on defense. And that's what the whole McVay system is. You've seen a lot more motion. He has a plan. You're putting different players in different positions to, to test the defense on the rules. And I thought he's done he's done a really good job on that so far, and it can show. And you look just the last two weeks against top five defenses, 55 at 78, 571 yards, 103 rushing yards, two touchdowns, 99 pass rating since Thomas Brown took over against two solid defenses. So to me, it's, it's not just coach speak anymore. It's not just, oh, he comes from the system. He's putting it into practice. Yeah. All right. Um, we talked a lot about the offense to start because Caleb Williams, you know, obviously had a very uh, big day. But in my opinion, I think the story of this game is actually the defense because this defense that is supposed to be elite, that is supposed to be putting this team in positions to win. This team is built around this defense. The defense is the engine. Let this team down. Let the team down in the fourth quarter. Let the team down in overtime. And they let the team down in critical moments, third downs. In the fourth quarter, when the Bears score a touchdown and just need a stop to get the ball back, they can't get off the field on two third and longs. I want to say off the top of my head, it's a third and 11 and a third and 12. Mm-hmm. If I can score a field goal. The Bears overcome that <laughs> by putting the game into overtime. And yes, the Bears did have a chance to win the game on offense. They did. But they punt the ball. Defense once again has a chance to get a stop. Montez Sweat, where we've been saying, where is Montez Sweat? Gets the big sack. They're backed up. Second and 17 or something. Third and nine. Again, confusion. Guys don't seem to be ready. They can't get off the field. The completion to Jordan Addison, Kevin Byard is the closest guy to him. And he's a safety, <laughs> he's not a quarterback. Um, giving up chunk plays to the middle of the field. Defense really let the team down. Um, so, Kevin, I just I just want to kick it to you. Just overall thoughts on the performance of the defense today. Yeah, I mean, you're right. They let the team down. Um, Clay, I, I have to ask you because I don't really understand – why they were in such soft coverage so many times on those third and longs, right? I mean, I, I I get Justin Jefferson's on the other side of the field. Trust me, I understand that you don't want to press Justin Jefferson all the time. Yeah, but Kevin, did you did Kevin you, Byer play? He was on the same side of the field, but continue. No, I mean that's what I mean. Do you have a good explanation? I mean, it's third and nine, and the guys are beyond the sticks. And 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 if you're Sam Darnold, you're looking at Joe Nettis and you say, "All right, a little stop curl route right here at the uh, right, just past the sticks. We'll catch the ball there first down, right?" Like they're hot routing that when they see that type of defense. What what is the what's the ideology there for Matty Berflus in that scenario? Because I, I can't think of it. So this is a catch twenty two, and really, there's I mean, it's it's tough because. 
they were so focused on taking away Justin Jefferson that they gave up mm. huge games to Jordan Addison and TJ Hawkinson. Huge games. Okay, and okay, you double team Justin Jefferson, and now you're leaving Kevin Byard one on one on Jordan Addison. For me, Kevin Byard, and there's a little motion there. And I don't know if that motion screwed up the count if they didn't want Byard on Addison in that situation. Byard's a veteran. It's third nine, and you can't give up that much cushion. To me, that's on Bayard. You got to realize where the sticks are. You play the sticks. Okay, maybe he's scared. He's going to run by him. He's, you know, maybe I can't guard Addison one on one. But to me, it comes back to Matt Eberflus. He's just being too passive. Okay, we know you love to run the four down linemen and and play coverage. Yeah. You're a big zone coverage four down guy. You got to blitz. Your four down ain't getting there. Okay, you can't just sit back and, and try to stop Justin Jefferson, let everybody else beat you. Here's – I'm going to give you guys some numbers. Fourth quarter in overtime today, Sam Darnold, Matt Eberflus made him look like Joe Montana. 11 to 13, 166 passing yards. Very efficient. Chunk plays. You're telling me in the fourth quarter in overtime, 166, 11 and 13, you can barely force an incompletion. You got to start heating these guys up, man. Sam Darnold is a guy that you 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 rattled him in the third. You saw him start taking a took a sack. He's not you're getting him off the field, and then you stop blitzing. This whole playing not to lose thing is just it, it's not working. And I, I get you want to take away Justin Jefferson, but now you're putting your your guys in bad matchups where they can't win. So to me, it comes back to Eberflus. You got to be able to adapt. And to me, he didn't show any adaptability in the end of that game when. Yeah, you, okay, we're going to take away Justin Jefferson again. Yeah, you double team Justin Jefferson. You have Kevin Byard playing 20 yards off on a 10 yard third down. What sense does that make? It's pitch and catch. I could have threw that ball. It's worth mentioning one of those third down conversions, I believe, was actually Nick Mullins. <laughs> when it was. Sam Darnold it was. was. You yeah, didn't even blitz Nick was. Mullins. Nick Mullins comes in. The guy's cold as ice. He's in the house. <laughs> Zone blitz this guy. This guy is ice cold, man. You're going to sit back and just play coverage. Let's just hope Mullins misses. No, turn the ratchet it up. Pressure this guy. Let's go. Um, one guy I do want to shout out because the pass rush has not been there. The defensive line has p- played poorly, to be quite frank. Yeah. The, the run game has not been good. The run defense has not been good. The pass rush has not been good. But Demarcus Walker has started to step up in some key moments here. Uh Last week, he had the two-point conversion stuff against Josh Jacobs. This week, again, on the goal line, Mm -hmm. he holds up Aaron Jones just enough so that Jonathan Owens can come in. Jonathan Owens forces the fumble. Obviously, Jonathan Owens makes a huge play to force that fumble, and fumble recovery probably doesn't happen without DeMarcus Walker. And then one drive, he basically ended single-handedly. Got a TFL, sack, very next play. Leads to a punt. Um so any love for DeMarcus Walker, any any love for anybody else you got, uh, Kevin? You want to hand out flowers to anybody? I would love to hand out flowers. I thought until the fourth quarter when, when Caleb really showed up, um, I thought Kyler Gordon was one of the best players on the field, uh, to be honest. I, he might have been the best player on the you field for the first correct. three quarters yep. of that game. I mean, you talk about a dog uh, through and through. I mean, this was a player who critical plays, throwing his body around on third down, deflections, right, tackles in the open field. And this is like – uh, this is a thing for Kyle Gordon. This is nothing new. He is consistently one of the most efficient, productive players on that defense. You know, just being asked to do so many different things, right, with the position that he plays. Sometimes he's in on the blitz. Sometimes he's going to be, you know, out there covering on a screen, make, having to make an open field tackle. And sometimes he's one-on-one with a really talented receiver in the slot. And it doesn't matter where he is, where he lines up. He's always involved in the play. And he's always showing up in big moments and, and making plays. And he is just an unbelievable athlete who I think is probably one of the most underrated pieces on this team and maybe one of the most underrated defenders in the NFL. Like he he doesn't get a lot of love because there's not a ton of big interceptions or not a ton of you know big plays that are gonna make it to social media, but he's just a super high quality player. And the amount of times he bailed the Bears out of some critical moments there in, in that defense with some deflections, just you know, I'm thinking about that one. I believe it was TJ Hogginson on the other side, and he just is like full out Superman deflection on third down to get the Bears the ball back. And I think they might have actually went down uh, and scored on that drive. I have to double check that. But that was a guy I tweeted during the game. I was like, in the first three quarters, Kyle Gordon is the best player in the football field right now. He was playing phenomenal. He deserves a ton of flowers for the way he played today. No, I like Kyler Gordon. I mean, 
he, he was all over the place. He made some plays in the run game. Like you said, that pass deflection, he was aware that Justin Jefferson was behind him, right? And he just had that sense. It was a normal zone, but just know who's behind you. He sees Justin Jefferson, reads the quarterback yeah. guys, makes the deflection. Demarcus Walker. I love Walker. He's not he, – you can't look at him like this guy that's just going to, you know, 10 sacks a year, but he's a guy that you can plug in anywhere. He can play three technique. He can play a five. He can play a six. He can play a nine. He does so many things for your defense, and, and he's very consistent. And he's one of those guys. I know you're out at training camp a little bit, Alex. He just brings energy. He's one of those energy guys, too, and he's one of those guys the players look to. So I, I love that. And um, Montez Sweat, yeah, he did get the sack, but that was a cover sack. I mean, like, he, he ran around the, the outside. You, typically, the quarterback step, and that was like a five-second sack. I know it goes in the book is a, is a big sack, and it was a big play. He tried to punch the ball out. Kudos to him, but I'm still not seeing enough from Montez Sweat. TJ Edwards got cooked a couple times by TJ Hawkinson. I mean, TJ, that's not his forte to, to cover a athletic big tight end. So, I mean, I'm not going to get get him get him too much, you know, for that. But uh, Edmonds, I thought, played okay, had the deflection, a couple deflections. And then Hawkinson just made some great plays. How about that? It was like it was like third or second in 18 after a holding call. And Hawkinson made this catch. And Edmonds, I don't know if Edmonds had his hands right in there. He just called that in. And the next play was a Jordan Addison third and nine, and he gets the first down. So just that play was so huge. It was just a second slow, but that was really good coverage. So there's, I mean, there's some guys that are playing and and doing all right, but you know, you just you just got to see more of that defense. And a lot of it, I think, comes down to Matt Eberflus. The thing you've been hanging your head on is, oh, our defense. I'm the defensive coordinator. Their defense is doing that. Your defense could have won this game, and they didn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then we just got to talk about the another blocked kick, and it's another one pressure coming right up the middle. Uh, Bears tried to get firm, didn't work. Uh, I saw some guys saying I, d- I didn't notice this myself. Some personnel changes were made actually on on the yes. last kick. Um, was talking with Cairo after the game about like, hey, you know, got that kind of redemption moment for not only you but your whole unit to put the game into overtime. How does that feel? And he basically was just like, just talking about how bad it felt that like there's been this negative light. And he's like, yeah, it's cool to make this kick, but like, six to my stomach that we have been so good for three years. And now we are letting the team down in big moments. So big accountability moment for Cairo Santos. And was just like, also, hey, was this the same thing? What's the issue here? And he, again, was kind of like, it's a tip your cap moment. Like the penetration happened to be coming right where the kick is going. Talks about the trajectory. Like, hey, what's up with the low trajectory? And he goes, this is something that I've always done. Like, yes, that's true. And he said, basically, I need to do these driving kicks, or I do do these driving kicks, because the wind at Soldier Field is crazy. And mm-hmm. <laughs> that's like a better way to play the wind is when I hit, when I hit, hit these driving kicks. It's better for the wind at Soldier Field. It's a way that they've found to be successful. So I also understand where he's like, for three years they've been great. Cairo Santos heading into this season, and I'm not sure where he stands now after these blocks, was the most accurate kicker in in Chicago Bears franchise history. Had the best seasons, the best overall career. Not Robbie Gold, Cairo Santos, most accurate kicker in, in Bears history. So I, I would understand why he would want to keep hitting, striking the ball the way he would. But but Clay, when you when you look at another blocked kick, two two attempts in a row. It was two attempts in a row. The last kick against the Packers and the first attempt against the Vikings. Again, you, you've played teams, you've played a lot in the league. When that happens, what's going on? You're looking around like, what's going on here? How do you address that? Man, that's a position where I, I would never want to play because it is just thankless. And those guys just <laughs> take a beating up and, the, and you can't do nothing. You, it's not like you can fire off and, and hit these guys. You just got to take a stand. And it's just you got to bow up and not give up any penetration. And it's hard. It's very hard, especially when you start putting two or three guys down there on that – the 48 yarder they hit to, to take it to overtime. You see Tevin Jenkins got like three players and he's just holding them off, man. Looks like mad mountain Dean. I mean, the guy is just, I mean, it's incredible, but that's just a thankless position. It just comes down to, to bone up, getting your feet in the ground and not giving up penetration. It's gotta be a big dude and strong. I mean, it's, that is literally just the simplest, 
goes back to high school, college, it's the same thing. They're going to overload a side, and they're going to try to get some push. If, you're, if your kicker has to kick it lower because he doesn't got a huge leg, got a better chance to block it. If he's a guy has got a huge leg and take a trajectory where he can kick it higher and get it out a little bit higher to start with, which there's not a lot of those guys out there. I mean, there's some. Then you're at a little bit of an advantage. But, yeah, with Cairo Santos, it's this give and take because he's so accurate, but he doesn't have that huge leg. So do you want to go for a guy that's got a big leg, can maybe kick a little bit higher trajectory that's maybe not as accurate? You stick with, with Santos, and then maybe you got to realize that we're going to be getting the same pressure thrown at us week in and week out because when he gets a little bit deep, he's got to take a little bit lower trajectory. So that's tough. I was always the wing, the guy on the outside, that you just got to get a hand on the guy rushing the edge. So I'm not an expert on the inside there, but I've been in a ton of special team meetings when you're getting these guys coached up front. And it's the most basic thing you can think. You're, they're not giving them any special saw, secret way. It's basically stay low, get your foot in the ground quick, and do not give up penetration. That's all there is to it. I'm concerned about the long-term future of Caro Santos for that reason, though. You know, they signed him to a contract extension this past offseason, right? He gets four years, $15 million, uh, which at the time, deserving of it, right? Like, I'm, I mean – he was the most accurate kicker in Bears history, like you mentioned, Alex. But if this is a problem where they're, it's not all on him, the trajectory thing. But if that's going to be a problem going forward, and I've always kind of thought this way about Kyra Santos, like value for the fact that he's money inside the 40. Like if you can get a guy that just doesn't miss kicks, that's great. But you get into scenarios where not having a guy who in today's NFL, where it's really common, can hit a 55-yarder or a 56-yarder consistently – it negatively impacts your team. It simply does. And you look at guys like Brandon Aubrey, right, who you can pick up off the street. I mean, that guy played in the AF or, or the UFL in 2022. He gets picked up. He's the best kicker in the NFL right now who has no problem hitting 60 yarders. And, yes, it is worth noting he had a kick block today by the Washington Commanders. Uh, that is worth noting. But to me, I look at some situations and I look at some scenarios and I'm like, this should be a situation where the Bears could be kicking and should be okay kicking a 55, 56-yarder. You remember the game earlier this year, week two against the Texans, he kicks a 56-yarder, gets left short, right? Those are some things that I think are concerning. And if the trajectory thing is real, Alex, you make a great point about the wind. I'm not a special teams guy enough to know, you know how, fa- how much of a factor that is. It seems like it is a big factor, especially at Soldier Field. But – I wouldn't mind them bringing somebody in in the offseason, pick up some soccer player off the street. I mean, Brandon Aubrey was drafted in the MLS, and he decided to switch to football. See what you have in a guy who might have a bigger leg. And if that guy's better and more capable of hitting longer field goals, to me it seems like more of an asset to the team. Um, that That's just the way I see that going forward. But Cairo Santos still has been phenomenal, hell of a job descended into OT. And, and you know, like you mentioned, uh, it, it's just been tough with him up front. It, it's it's kind of out of his hands there with that protection. So um, just some thoughts there, my, my quick kicking sure. thoughts. For what it's worth, um, since 2022, Cairo Santos, 18 of 21 from 50-plus, mm. but his career long is 50 Five. His career is 55. It's not the 58, 59 yeah. yarders, the, even the 60 plus that we do see some guys hit. Um, before we get out of here, any final thoughts? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick it right back to you, Lapka. Yeah. I mean, again, you know, final takeaways, final thoughts, a little quick recap is, you know, uh, I think. It's self-explanatory about the head coach, right, and how they find keep keep finding ways to lose games. There is a common denominator here, and uh, you know, good teams don't lose the, these ways. That that that's simply what happens. When it comes to Caleb Williams, there's one thing I did want to mention that I didn't mention before. I think one of his best character traits as a quarterback in these in his career so far has been his ability to protect the football, and and it, it really was in this game impressive because you had a defense in the Minnesota Vikings that was number one in the NFL in takeaways. I mean, they were doing a phenomenal job, as you mentioned, getting pressure, forcing quarterback to make bad decisions. The guy doesn't really make bad decisions. He might miss a throw here and there. He's got to work on the accuracy in certain moments, but he's never really throwing the ball to the other team. I mean, some of those keyhole throws, the pure arm talent, it kind of allows him, it prevents him from from those turnover-worthy plays. So uh, that was just one of the big things for me that plays into my thoughts and my declaration of Caleb Williams being him. It's early, but we're making it. Um, That's the takeaway. And, And I really, I walk away from this game feeling sure a little bit upset that they lost, right? And that this whole season, 
you know, as they continue to lose, you just you just look back on it and think this this all feels avoidable. This feels like this could be a seven and four team, right? But we have to turn our attention to the future. We have to turn our attention to next year and what this team could look like with all these guys under contract. And when I do that and I cope as a Bears fan uh, into the the waning hours of Sunday night, I feel pretty positive about the future of the team. I feel positive about the guy who's going to be leading this team, hopefully for the next decade at Caleb Williams. I feel good about the skill position players around him. The trenches need to be fixed up, right? But in general, when you talk about the nucleus of a team and when you talk about the things that matter for the younger players, I, I feel good that this is a team that hopefully, we say it all the time, can be a legitimate contender next year if they have a coach, hopefully, who's able to make you know some better decisions and allow them to win um, some closer games. So that's kind of my takeaway. It is, Clay, like you mentioned, it is getting a little emotionless. So that's why I'm kind of looking for, to the future now. Like, it, like, I was hurt at the end of the game, you know, knife to the heart, but there's no more twisting of the dagger. It's just a straight knife to the heart and out. You know, that that's the way it is at, at, at this point. So um, feeling good about the future is, is my little uh, my little short word recap. Clay, final thoughts? Yeah, quick and painless now, Kevin. You don't have to worry about the, uh, you know, the, the excruciating pain that, like we got last week. But for me, I think the offensive line has looked better these last couple of weeks, and a lot of that has to do with the offensive coordinator not putting them in terrible situations. That's good. Now, to me, the glaring weakness is the D line. You got to get pressure, and especially in this division when you got quarterbacks Jared Goff, Jordan Love, Sam Darnold. You got you got to get pressure on these guys especially if you have a guy that doesn't want to blitz as your head coach slash defensive coordinator. Got to get pressure. You got to get some dogs in here up front, and we got to get Montez Sweat playing well. As far as Caleb Williams and throws downfield uh, 15 or more air yards, he was 5 of 12 for 141 yards today, best of, it, best of the season. And you know the list of quarterbacks with 300 yards, two touchdowns, no turnovers against the Vikings? Caleb Williams is a list of one. So this guy's special. He's done some special things. And doing this against Brian Flores, Brian Flores was my linebacker coach when I was on the Patriots. I just remember playing against him in practice, how he always had his linebackers coached up. These guys be lining up, and you wouldn't know where they were coming from, the blitzes and, and everything they, they were doing. That's hard to do. So the Chicago should feel good about what they're seeing from Caleb Williams. I think this shows and reinforces, again, if you put a decent offensive coordinator in front of this guy, a guy that can coach him that he looks up to, that has the aura presence from whenever you were born, same thing, um, <laughs> that I think he is going to be a good quarterback, great quarterback. I'm not going to put the stamp of greatness on him yet, but he is a guy that you're going to be able to win some games with, and he just keeps on getting better. So rest easy. We lost another game, better draft order. Matt Eberflew closer to getting fired. Hopefully you can hit on a head coach, but you do know this, that you are looking good, as good as you have in the last, I don't know how many years in the quarterback position. When it comes to football, professional football, especially, is you got to have a good quarterback. So there you go. Clay Harbor says, looking as good as they have in quite some time. Kevin Lapka puts the stamp, him and he cricket on, oh. on Caleb Williams. Listen, the Bears have gotten close. How many times have we said this over the past three years? I know, dude. Bears I was got, just gonna say they they gave the Packers and the Vikings their best shot. It was not good enough. Too many mistakes. And, um, you know, the Bears, they're a team that seems like they need to give you their best shot and also get some breaks at this point, which they haven't gotten. You know, Keenan Allen has a huge day. Could have been bigger. A 50-50 call gets overturned. That leads to a blocked field goal. That could have been seven. You know, yeah. Bears are driving. That could have been seven. It, it, it instead turns into a Vikings touchdown. And then the other 50-50 call, Alex, we didn't even talk about. Jordan Addison stepped out of bounds. But again, that, that's kind of my point. Because, because not all stadiums have the camera. That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. The camera, so let's that's use wild. the camera. <laughs> that is pretty wild. Um, so, it, and to me, that's just where the Bears are, right? When you're a team that has to give a, a good opponent your best shot and get a few good breaks, that's just who you are. You know, the the Kansas City Chiefs of the world are able to overcome those moments. The best teams are able to overcome those moments. And uh, and and the Bears just seem like they need they need the the bound the ball to bounce their way. They need the ball to bounce their way, and certainly over the past five games, it has not. Okay, so just like the Bears' defense in the winning moments of this game, and just like the Bears over the course of this season, 
the internet for me at the press box at Soldier Field has fizzled, <laughs> has fizzled on me. Uh, very apropos for where I think I was going, which is basically, as Kevin Lapka said, Caleb Williams is him any cricket. However, it's a five-game losing streak. And as Thomas Brown said earlier this week, there are no attaboys in this league. That's just five L's. And, uh, and the Bears got to figure it out. The Bears got to figure it out. Close, but they've been way too close too many times. They got another shot in a short week. Hey, maybe a short week can, can spur something. Typically, short weeks are tough, but maybe the Bears have not been able to get anything going. Maybe the short week will help them. <laughs> Less preparation for the Lions. Listen, the Bears have given the Vikings a good shot. The Bears have given up. Packers a good shot. Lions coming up on Thursday. On that note, we are not going to have our typical Wednesday episode for you. We're going to go straight into preview for Lions. Thanksgiving Day, early in the morning on Thursday. So we're going to be that that preview episode on Wednesday. Thank you for sticking around with us on the Charter Podcast today. We hope you stick around for that preview episode on Wednesday. For Clay Harbor, for Kevin Lapka, I'm Alex Shapiro. This is the Charter Podcast brought to you by St. Xavier University. Hope you all have a wonderful week and a happy early Thanksgiving to you all as well.